So now in this segment, I'm gonna talk about landscape design techniques that you can use in your residence or your business. Some of the things we think about when you're designing, no matter how small of a space that you have, we think about habitat. What kind of habitat can we create with our plants? What kind of floral patterns? We wanna think about harmony, wildlife and food nesting, function. Do we have recreation areas? Do we wanna entertain outside? We wanna talk about genus loci, which is the sense of place. How do we wanna feel in this place? Where is this place? And give it a sense of place and not just a generic landscape. You wanna look at your grading and drainage. Where is your land sloping? Where is water gonna collect? We're gonna look at spatial definitions. We're gonna talk about view sheds. Sometimes we wanna open up a view to get a long, beautiful view of something. Other times we want to block off something we don't want to see and screen it. And then we also always want to think about energy efficiency on which side of the tree in the south side, the hottest um, part, the, you want to put you know, tall shrubs and trees to kind of block that sun and create some shade and energy efficiency on your building. So resources, when you're starting to do your plan, Decide what you want to create. Have a piece of paper, have, to, have it to scale so you can start drawing your areas. Uh, study your site, what kind of soils do you have? Read books about the, there's a big listing on the Native Plant Society website. Try to think about what plants you might want to plant. Again, the Florida Native Plant Society, you can you put in your zip code and it'll give you a list of all of the native plants in your region that you can choose from. Very handy list to do your design with. Uh, learn your local resources and then when you're getting ready to plant, make sure you buy locally grown native plants. If you go to the Florida Association of Native Plant Nurseries, the website is afnn.org. They have a listing of all of the native plant nurseries right in your area. So native plant design principles. We want to plant with diversity in mind. That does not mean you have 10 different plants right next to each other. We want diversity, but we also want a sense of design and continuity. We want to plant the right plant in the right place. If you have dry soils, you know, don't put a wet, loving plant in its place. You know, we have a native hibiscus and it's beautiful, um, but it really likes wet soil conditions. And of course, we want to have vertical layers. Whenever we landscape with native plants, we always want to place your trees first, your large shrubs, and then medium shrubs, small shrubs, and ground covers. We want to landscape in layers because we're mimicking nature. So the low impact design considerations, we want to use native plants. We want to retain snags on site. Snags are dead trees, or you can cut the top out, but leave some of it standing because that's what a lot of insects forage on. And you know, what, what are birds looking for? Insects. So it's always very healthy to have a snag. If you're a business and you don't want to have something dead up front, put it in the back or on the side where it's not seen. Want to limit your turf to 35% of the conventional areas of turf. We want to limit irrigation, uh, low volume irrigation. And once our plants are established, you know, we want to be able to shut the irrigation off and only irrigate when we actually need it not every day, not every week. And then we want to eliminate or, or reduce or limit our fertilizers and insecticides and publicize the green products and the green ideas. Talk to your neighbors about what you're doing. Um, get these native plant ideas out there. And then again, like I mentioned earlier, most importantly, you need to leave some open soil areas, not even any mulch so that we can have that interaction and butterflies can find the minerals that they're looking for. So this slide is talking about plant provenance. We have, you know, approximately 3,000 native plants in Florida, but, but that doesn't mean we have that large of a selection in your area. 
the plants that grow in Miami are not gonna grow in temperate North Florida and Central Florida has its own unique sets of native plants to use. So make sure that, that you're using native plants from your region so that they can thrive and grow well. Study your soils, know what kind of soil that you have, know the pH, that'll help you select plants that will thrive. So USGS maps are helpful to find out you know, what was there on your site before the subdivision was there? Or what, what was there before? What native ecosystem? That'll give you clues. If you know it was a sandhill, you automatically know you can go to the sandhill community plants and those will thrive there. And you want to know your plant hardiness zone. Um, now I'm going to talk about the golden mean. When we start to talk about landscape design, um, I always design with nature. And what does that mean? You know, the golden mean is a proportion, 3.16, that repeats itself in nature. And then on this slide, you can see in a conch shell, in the venation pattern of leaves, um, flower arrangements, that spiral, that proportion is always used. What I do is when I'm laying out a bed line, I always use a curve and I use either a Fibonacci number, which is a number found in nature, or proportions like that. And I find that the spaces afterwards are very much more harmonious. Nature does not have 90 degree angles. We should not have plant beds with 90 degree angles. It makes people feel a little chaotic. Everything should be flowing, no angles, no acute angles. Um, so some of the landscape design elements that we're going to talk about when you're designing your landscape are line, form, texture, scale, unity, balance, transition and continuity, proportion, rhythm, focal points, repetition, contrast, simplicity, and aesthetics. Okay, that sounds like a whole bunch of things right there, but it all comes together to create a harmonious landscape design. And when you're talking about plant selection, you have to really find out what's available. What I do is I, my uh, native plant nursery that I use is Green Isle Gardens in Groveland, and they're in Central Florida. What I do, I go on their website, I look at their plant list, and then I find out what's available. And then I do my landscape design and they always have, there's so much available. And I just want to go back and touch on the plant provenance. When I said, you know, there's about 2,000, about 3,000, you know, native plants in Florida. Um, but in Central Florida, the 10 county Central Florida area, there's only about 500 in cultivation that you can actually purchase. A lot of our native plants, once you take them out of their native habitat, they don't survive. You cannot grow them in containers, so they're not found at nurseries. So there's only about 500, think about that. There's only 500 trees, shrubs, ground covers, clumping grasses and vines that we can plant to feed our birds and wildlife. Contrast that with, there are about 25 to 30,000 non-native plants with our same latitude that can grow here. So we really need to, you know, use those native plants whenever we can. So plant selection and placement, you know, take a look at this slide. You know, you've got different shapes and forms to plants. You have columnar, oval, spreading, weeping, you know, decide what you want where, you know, look at your view shed and decide what you want. Do you want a vegetative screen? Then you're going to want that uh, layered look and something with a very coarse texture. And then with textures, um, on this slide, I have a photo of the Zamia pumila and Conradina canescens. The glaucous blue, gray, green of the Conradina um, contrasts with the deep evergreen of the Zamia, and they look awesome together. So putting those textures and colors together really are striking in a landscape. And color. Color is not the first thing I think of. The first thing I think of is what aster type wildflowers can I plant to create color? And then what is available? And then maybe, you know, 
start grouping colors together and what you like. And just take a look at these, you know, the purple iris, the the bachelor's button, the scorpion's tail, the native hibiscus, the color texture and form. We have so much to work with. Um, so just pay attention to that and the end result will be a striking landscape. Um, again, some more tuck texture and form, the beauty berry, the button bush, you know, the uh, hymenicalis, uh, a spider lily, you know, think about what the plant looks like and when you're putting plants together in combinations. So in variety and contrast, you want to think about transitions and continuity. You want to have a continuity. You want to have groupings of plants. Massings of plants are better than individual different species here and there. And think about massings and where you want a focal point in the distance maybe. This is a landscape plan and it's showing those curved walkways. There's an amphitheater to the left and a garden to the right and it shows, you know, the transitions between spaces. You can have a symmetrically balanced, you know, with plant materials looking exactly alike on either side of a house or structure, or you can do asymmetrical balance. You can have you know, two large shrubs and then one small, you know, balancing that, you know, asymmetrically. And then, you know, is wind an issue? These are all things you can think about when putting your plants together. If wind's an issue, you want to block that. The sun orientation for energy efficiency, traffic and noise abatement, you know, think about that. A little earth berm with shrubs on top can maybe block some of that noise. When you're, if you're doing a residential landscape, Think ahead of time on what type of footpaths you want to have around your yard and where you want to walk and put that down first and then plant around those footpaths so you can have that. And this is a bubble diagram that I do with a lot of design. Decide with, you know, on your plan with, you know, well, I want to have an outdoor recreation here, here for croquet or something or Here's where I want to have a vegetable garden. Here's where I have, want to have a wildflower garden. So start circling those areas so it can narrow down to define your design. Most importantly, think about the views on the outside, but also be inside of your house and think about what view you want when you're looking out. That's important too. So now line and form. On this, you can start to see the curvilinear shapes that I'm doing with the bed lines. You know, the uh, grass can be in the middle and you can have your planting beds along the edges or you, um, which is most harmonious and most functional, you know, that way. And you can start to define your, your bed lines and where your plants are gonna be. And keep in mind, you don't wanna have tall plants right outside of a window. When you're doing your bed lines and curves, put that tall stuff in the back so your eye can travel so the space looks bigger. Now this is a finished planting plan showing uh, walkways, in this case a boardwalk to a boat dock, and then on the other way another curvilinear walkway. And look at the grass area I have right in the middle for, for a fire pit and for uh, dogs to run and for maybe to have a picnic in the um, in the middle of your yard but look at all of the clusters of native plants that I have around and each cluster from the property line in I go from tall medium and small so that my view is always going up the layers and I've clustered wildflowers together and then I've put small shrubs around them and now on this plan I'm gonna this plan shows you know an ops an optimal design for wildflower gardens. So you can see this horseshoe shape, you know, uh, area that's adjacent to the roadway. What that is, is either, you know, bricks, a brick border or aluminum edging, or it can be some small shrubs like Ilex vomitoria nana or Conradina canescens. And I have those shrubs in a horseshoe pattern and inside that horseshoe pattern, is your wildlife, your wildflower area. 
So um, it's distinguished, it's defined, it has a border, it has an edge. This makes it fit in with the neighborhood much better. And then the grass area is behind it, and then there's a curvilinear bed line up by the house. Now on the left side, with that, this is a this is a situation where you have, you know, your neighbor is right next door. Well, the hatched area is another wildflower area, but what I've done is put the small shrubs in the containment of the wildflowers along the property line. So you have a, a small hedge, and then on the other side of it is your wildflowers. Now your wildflowers can do what they want to do. Some are going to be dormant, some are going to be flowering. Some of those dead leaves have serve a wildlife purpose. The, the green link spider nests inside the dead um, spent bloom of salvia coccinea. Um, the plant actually extracts nutrients from those dead leaves for a time. So we want the wildflower garden to look like life, the life that li alive and dead and in transition and blooming and not blooming. So to contain that, you have to put those small shrubs, evergreen shrubs around it or the brick border so that you have that containment. So at least the edge looks nice and formal and contained, and this helps you fit in with the neighborhood much better. Again, planting in layers, you have a foreground and a subshrub layer and ground covers. It's extremely important to to think about layers when you're doing your landscape design. And also think about plant combinations. If you have a shady area, you're gonna to wanna to use hydrangea, corsifolia, you know, the dog hobble, the leucathy, the salvia vicella is a, is a ground cover. All of these plants go really well together, not only with texture and form, but they all like shade. Uh, the understory tree, Cyananthus virginicus, is a beautiful white flowering tree that loves to grow under the dappled shade of large oaks. If we're wanting to attract the most number of bird species, we plant um, mulberry, uh, the, the haws, the summer haw or the parsley haw, hollies. All of these have berries and fruits that the birds love. The, the summer haw and the parsley haw are really important, you know, large shrubs because they have, the berries are very small. Some of our smaller songbirds, they can't chew, so they have to swallow the berries whole. So a lot of those berries are very good. Um, some more plants that attract the most number of bird species are our state tree, the sable palmetto palm tree. Feeds 33 different species of birds. Our wax myrtles, um, they require a little bit more water than you know, typical, but they su uh, support a large number of bird species. And we have elderberry, which is good. And then late in the season, we want to plant the Calicarpa americana, the beauty berry, because those berries are ripe in the late fall when all of the other berries have gone away. And it's a port an important resource, food resource for the birds. So, so for butterflies, you might want to plant, uh, there, there's all sorts of lists you can look up for native butterflies. There's all sorts of wonderful books out there. Mark Minow has one of them. Um, you, Cassia bicapsularis. Um, this is one of the only trees that is a butterfly nectar plant, and that's Celtis laevigata, the sugarberry or hackberry tree. And just take a look at that trunk. It's very sculpturesque. And then the prunus species, the black cherry prunus serotina, the prunus angustifolia, our native plum trees are an important food source and they're just gorgeous. They're multi, they're deciduous, multi-trunked and the same, just like crepe myrtles and about the same size of a crepe myrtle. So this is a really good substitution to get rid of those monoculture crepe myrtles everywhere. So our native plum trees, the flowers are actually born on the bare branches in the springtime. It's just striking. And then the green leaves come out in the summertime. More importantly, it has a really nice sized fruit that birds and other wildlife um, eat. So now I'm gonna talk about insects and production and the plants that you can plant to attract your native insects to feed the birds. 
Uh, native wildflowers, they're an important resource, resource of pollen for these insects. Some of these insects have a specialized relationship. Again, they've co-evolved together. They have specialized relationship with the plant that they can only survive on the pollen from a certain species of native plant. Um, so, um, so we want to attract pollinators. Um, the wild lime is a small tree. That's good, and here I have a, a photo of the sw giant swallowtail caterpillar and the uh, butterfly form of it that uh, gets nectar from this plant. The Monarda punctata is a wonderful pollinator plant, a pawpaw. Um, you know, our goal is to attract pollinators and feed pollinators. All right, everybody, welcome back. We are ready to handle questions. Um, let's get this into full screen here. All right, everybody, welcome back. We are uh -oh. ready to handle questions. Um, Karina, if you could turn off your YouTube video. Yeah. Okay. All right, everybody. Thank you. Okay. Um, we have our first question from Diane Goldberg, who, if you are a member or become a member, she did a lunch and learn recently um, about attracting birds and butterflies to your yard and also discussed her experience with code enforcement coming down on her for her native yard and how she succeeded in court. Um, she asks, what native grasses can be used instead of non-native lawns? Which native grasses won't need to be mowed? So um, that's an excellent question because um, what we're trying to do is get rid of grass areas and, you know, have enough grass areas that are good for recreation and entertainment, but anything in excess of that, you know, you know, take out and put some native plants in. A good, what I call a turf substitute uh, native plant is phyla nautiflora. The common name is frog fruit, and you can get it at any native plant nursery. And it grows about six to 10 inches, but it's kind of a slow grower. And it looks like grass from a distance. It's an evergreen all year long. Um, I recommend mowing it about three times a year to keep it kind of uh, uniform and consistent looking. So it looks like grass from a distance. And this is what I talked about in the video as putting like a half moon shape of this plant in the front before in front of all of your other native plants to kind of tie in with the other grass landscapes in the neighborhood. Another um, turf substitute, you know, you can put in a native is a switchgrass. Um, and also if you have some moist soils, dichondra is, it, it, you don't, there is no maintenance to dichondra. You don't mow it, you don't do anything. It's a very small, short plant. Right. And, you know, one of the things that you talked about in your last lecture, Karina, is that we don't have to replace all of the turf. Right. We, you can have a turf area that maybe you incorporate some fog fruit, frog fruit, or some, um, mm -hmm. some sunshine mimosa, but it's not a sin to have, you know, a small area of turf that is, that is non-native. If you have dogs or, you know, you want to have a place to throw the football around or whatever right. you do. You know, so you don't have to replace everything with natives and be, you know, endlessly seeking the perfect native <laughs> replacement for everything. Um, because as you, as you said, most of our native grasses are clumping. You know, they're large clumping grasses that you would use more as, in a traditional landscape, it would be more like a small bush placement. Right. Right. Like and, and, and keep in mind with any landscape to have at least one or two areas of just plain soil for butterflies to do puddling. And that's how they, they uh, get moisture is from the soil. And there's also um, solitary wasps and bees that burrow and other insects that burrow into the soil. Uh, so we need to provide, you know, spaces for them as well. Right. And Dana asked a question that I think a lot of other people have is, you know, where do I find a list of native nurseries and, and native landscapers for each county, which I think the native landscapers is much, much more difficult because there's just it, not. It's difficult to find a native plant landscape architect. Um, 
but you will find if you go to the website www.fann.org that's the website for the florida association of native plant nurseries and if you put in your zip code it'll come up with all of the native plant nurseries in your area um, and then from there um, they also have a section of i think they call it uh, native landscape professionals so you can find a landscape designer on that website as well and if there's none in your area go to your nearest local native plant nursery and ask them you know do you know anyone who can design my landscape and i will and most native plant nurseries they will help you with your design when you're walking around trying to pick out plants they will talk to you about your yard your soil what scope what goes best where and they have they'll answer pretty much all of your questions right at the nursery as well and you know it depends on the nursery but they might also be doing a few installs they might have you know a company they work mm -hmm. with who might be familiar with native plants so even if they're not listed on the fan website you know they might have professionals that might be able to help you and, and also one other note you may have to go 30 to 40 miles outside of town to get to a native plant nursery they're not common unfortunately if native plants were more mainstream and you could buy them at home depot or lowe's our birds and butterflies would be a lot better off. Um, but unfortunately, they're typically a little outside of town and you have to go that extra effort to to get you know native plants in Florida. Yeah, you sure do. Um, the next question is from Rosalie Hewins, who asked if it's OK to integrate native plants with non native plants in a landscape. And that does that affect watering? Um, Yes, and I typed a little message in there, but it's perfectly fine to mix natives and non-natives. However, you do have to pay attention to the water regime that the plants like. If you plant a non-native next to a native, make sure that they have similar watering requirements because a lot of our native plants, because they're used to the natural precipitation rates in Florida, so a lot of them don't need irrigation systems or a lot of extra water. So if you're gonna have a non-native plant that needs to get water every now and then, you may run into some problems because the native plants won't like it and they won't, uh, I don't know that they'll perish, they may perish, but you know, they'll, they'll probably struggle a little bit. I know that there's some native plants like Garbaria and uh, muley grass, a, a whole lot of them that once they're established, there's really not a lot of watering. If you're in an urban area, you may have to help it along, you know, once or twice a quarter, once they're established. Uh, so to mix the native and the non-native, it's fine, but you just make sure that they're, they're on the right water regime. Right, and say, for example, you're trying to mix something that requires fertilization, like say a peach tree mm -hmm. or an orange tree, you know, I would recommend you're looking for plants that might do better in a higher nutrient, native plants to, to be nearby, that would do better in a higher nutrient environment, like say wetland plants, you know, deep rooted grasses, something like that. Um, and you can use our plant finder, fnps.org, you know, there's a drop down, then go to plants. And instead of selecting what is your soil, select, you know, a, like needs wetter conditions if you're doing something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, most native plants don't like fertilizer. Fertilizers are for plants that are not native because they can't grow well in our soils because we have such sandy soils. They're pretty much, you don't really use fertilizers on native plants at all. Uh, Maria Pisano asks for suggestions. Any suggestions for a long rectangular area that is 100 feet long and 25 foot wide? It's oh. like a driveway on the side of the house running from the backyard to the street. Oh, okay. So that I would put um, calament. It's a calamintha georgiana. They only get about, you know, 18 inches tall, and they're a wonderful border for a narrow area like that. Um, any of your asters, uh, narrow leaf aster, you know, pityopsis, the silk leaf aster, uh, chrysopsis, and I can repeat these if I'm going too fast, um, calament. Any of the anything in the aster family, the Chrysopsis, um, our state wildflower is Coreopsis. There's two species. There's Coreopsis levenworthii and there's Coreopsis lanceifolia. 
um, either one of those would do well. Um, my personal favorite is Biden's Alba. Its common name is beggar tick. It has those little stickers that kind of stick on your clothing when you walk by, but they are the most prolific uh, at, in the Astor family. And I will tell you that and the Monarda punctata, which is the dotted horseman, those two plants feed a ton of pollinators, which of course, once the pollinator insects are attracted to those plants, then it's bird food. You know, birds, so birds eat a certain percentage of them. So those are another two plants that I would plant in that, that narrow area. If you want to look for like an evergreen small shrub to kind of plant, like intersperse, I would plant like the flowers and then I'd have a, a line of an evergreen shrub and then go back to the flowers and you know, kind of create some interest. And some of the small evergreen shrubs could be um, viburnum, abovedum, and with the cultivar, um, Mrs. Schiller's, that's our native viburnum, and the Schiller's is a dwarf variety. You could also do a small holly, um, the Ilex vomitoria uh, variety Nana is a very small shrub as well that has berries on it. Uh, so all of those plants I would recommend. And, you know, you could intersperse with the wildflowers, maybe some, you know, love grass perhaps, or, mm -hmm. you know, add some interest along the border or curve it or something? The love grasses, there's Aerogrostis spectabulus, which has like a, a, a really delicate uh, purplish plumage. And then there's the Aerogrostis, um, uh, there's another species, I can't remember the species name, that has more of a pale uh, plumage to it. Yeah. Um, Diane suggests blue-eyed grass for mm -hmm. lawns. So that's good, but it doesn't really, it's not very uniform looking. Which... It's not very uniform looking. And also um, it, it doesn't really multiply a lot yeah. like Phyla not a flora does. You'd have to plant a lot of them and they don't like full sun. They will grow in full sun to partial shade to even a lot of shade. It's a very, it has a wide range, but it prefers a uh, dappled sunlight. And then it also requires, you know, more water than, you know, some other native plants as well. Yeah, it does like it kind of wet. And I haven't seen that, that dry loving blue eyed grass. I haven't seen it in cultivation yet. Have you? No, I haven't seen that in cultivation, but I have um, the blue eyed grass under some palm trees and it's a beautiful little patch and it does multiply just a little bit and in the springtime it has those delicate little blue flowers but it stays moist under there and it's a little bit shady so that's kind of a better spot for the uh, blue-eyed grass than a lawn substitute yeah i definitely recommend before deciding on oh i want the species or i want that species yeah like look at your lawn when it rains mm -hmm. i mean like and walk around in it and see mm -hmm. how much sun does this get you know does it get six hours or 12 hours of sun in the summer does this ever pond that's gonna that's gonna help you succeed with your landscape planning a lot more than picking species that mm -hmm. you just want will because they might die and then you'll be sad yeah and that's that's another thing with the native plants if they, they need a lot of maintenance up front. You can't just plant them and walk away. They are low maintenance, but they have to be established first. You ha the, there's heavy maintenance up front because you have to do the weeding. You have to water them regularly. Some of the uh, wildflowers, you have to water them every single day for a couple of weeks when they're first planted and then wane off a little, little by little until you're not watering at all. Um, but that, maintenance up front is very important. Yeah. And then it goes to very low maintenance later on, but it needs that care up front. Mm -hmm. um, Beth asks, is there a turf grass that is more sustainable than St. Augustine? And will any of the turf substitutes grow in shade? Well, I think we've kind of discussed the shade a little bit. There's definitely more sustainable grasses than St. Augustine. It's a big pet peeve of mine that St. Augustine grass is even being sold at all in Florida. It requires copious amounts of water. And as you know, we're in a water shortage and our Floridan aquifer is being depleted. So all of these um, 
you know, yards with St. Augustine grass to keep it healthy, you've got to water it a lot. It does require fertilizer because it is a three and a half foot tall plant that we shave off at three inches and their roots don't really grow real well when you're shaving it off, mowing it all the time. So it takes a lot of maintenance, a lot of water. The more sustainable approach is Bahia. If you're going to go like a solid sod, a, a non-native solid sod is Bahia, the Argentine variety. So you don't get those big tall seed spikes. But don't plant the Bahia near a conservation or a wild area because it will, you know, get uh, grow into the wild area and spread and we don't want, we don't want that but if you have a typical subdivision lawn and you want something more sustainable definitely the bahia is the way to go you don't need to water it it goes a little bit dormant in the winter time um, you can water it and it'll stay green all year long but it comes back naturally and it does not require insecticides fertilizers uh, as much as the saint augustine does and then for the non-native turf substitutes, like I said earlier, the phyla nautiflora is the perfect plant to plant as a substitute for any kind of non-native grass. It kind of looks like grass. Do you want to discuss perennial peanut? No, no, I don't <laughs> recommend it. Okay. It, I, it. It was brought into the state originally as a feed for to feed cows in a field as a pasture plant. Did not go over well there, so the growers tried to find an ornamental use to it. Um, the University of Florida uh, is part of the research behind bringing perennial peanut to the state, but it is invasive. You will be. I tried it about 10 years ago and some of my clients, I had one that was, you know, very upset at me because you cannot put any other plants next to it. It'll take over and clobber everything. High maintenance to keep it in check. Where I've seen it successfully is the city of Sanford put it in between the back of the curb and the sidewalk as like a ground cover in there where it can't get out anywhere. But I've also seen it planted. It, it, it's the underground runners will go 16 feet under a driveway and pop up on the other side and you can't get rid of it. It'll just take over. If you have 10 acres, it'll take over 10 acres and it squelches out all of your other plants. Uh, it's uh, not a good plant to plant. So for anybody who's not familiar with perennial peanut at like, you know, botanizing at 60 miles per hour, you'll notice it. And if you're looking at a median, it will be darker green. It has wide mm -hmm. leaves and after mowing it gets little yellow flowers. So it's very scenic yeah. after it's mowed. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. Uh, now this is quite the question. Jim <laughs> asks, asks uh, Jim S asks, any suggestions on working with local governments on adding native areas to existing urban parks? Um, the native, the Florida Native Plant Society, each chapter represents um, one or more counties, and we represent every county around the state. And there are action items to do just that in several different chapters, as, as well as we help cities and counties rewrite their landscape ordinances so that there's a minimum percentage of native plants mandated for every project that happens, which is a big thing. Now, the retrofit um, that's, those are specific projects. And I find that cities and counties, um, are w welcome. They welcome the, uh, partnership and working with them and coming up with the projects, especially if you're part of the native plant society. Um, we have, we've been around for 41 years. We're a scientifically based organization. So if you join and you become a member, you can be a part of that project that helps make that, uh, happen in our parks around our cities and counties. I, I think more of that needs to happen. It is happening on a small scale, but um, it probably needs to happen a little bit more. Yeah, so as Karina said, you wanna get in on the remodel, right? Oh, if you have a particular park of interest, maybe make friends with the, the physical plant operator or the, the parks and rec person at the, at the city or, or county and say, hey, uh, when do you think of redoing the landscaping on this park? And then make sure you join your local chapter, the Florida Native Plant Society, fnps.org forward slash chapters is where you can find out, you know, where is your chapter? Where do they meet when they're not in a pandemic? And get contact information. You can also contact me and I can direct you to 
the person of interest. Don't just go to a county commission meeting and say, <laughs> this park doesn't have any native plants. I want the native plants at the park. You know, that's not, that's not going to get you anywhere, but a, working. A really, yeah, a really good, Val is absolutely right. A really good method is to have a, a group of people have a plan, a blueprint, you know, have, get, get a base plan of a portion of the park and say, if we take these plants out, here's the types of native plants we can put in, have a picture of the native plant, and then say, if we plant these native plants, we can feed these species of birds, we can feed these species of butterflies. And if you're prepared with the plan, it's a lot easier for the city to acquiesce and say, oh, okay, here's a plan, here's what it's gonna, here's what it's, it's gonna feed. And it, it's um, easier to get funding that way. And the city personnel can visualize, you know, what you're talking about. And it, that's a, a very successful approach I've seen work in the past. Yes, and make sure that you can follow through on this. This is not a, you know, you talk to one person one time, have a meeting, have a cup right. of coffee, and then it's over. Like, you're, you're going to be working on this for maybe two, three, five years. Follow it through. So mm -hmm. make sure that you have the people in your chapter and a, a small team that you can follow through on a single park. And I think that's probably your best chance of success at, at this point in our current um, mm -hmm. climate. And, and it's it's the most rewarding thing in the world to be the impetus behind planting a native plant in a public place or, or at a, in a private yard and to see the birds come and the butterfly and, and to track that, you know, because there's zero insects, birds and butterflies on non-native plants. So it's really exciting to be a part of something when you plant the native plants and come back and see all the life happening um, afterwards. Very rewarding. Especially in a public space where other people can enjoy it. It's yes. Pretty incredible. Um, Wanda G asks, if my lawn has dollar weed, can I assume it's wet enough for switchgrass? Yes. Good. Short answer. <laughs> Tim Keating says, I just... And by the way, if, if, ever, if, if you don't know, dollar weed is actually a native plant. If you don't know that, it's a lot of people, the dollar weed comes up in St. Augustine lawns when they overwater and they actually spray it out so they can have a monoculture lawn. And that's a native plant that sh really should be growing there. <laughs> yeah, it is. And it has really nice flowers too. So, um, you know, you could mm -hmm. keep it if you wanted. Um, Tim Keating says, I just moved from New Jersey to Claremont area and he was doing native plant landscape design and he's still learning Florida native. So welcome, Tim. I hope you can start oh, doing that's... native plant landscape design here in Florida. Oh, please, please contact me. Um, I, um, if you put your phone number in the chat session, Val will send it to me. Um, I, I would really like to chat with you offline about native plant landscape design. I can give you a lot of information about Florida. Yeah, Tim, or you can email me and I'll email connect to you guys however you want to do it yeah, that'd, that'd be perfect um someone called the night asks how should glyphosate be applied to torpedo grass under mature live oak trees is spraying safe or would brushing the leaves be effective and safer yeah um there's probably other chemicals better for torpedo grass uh, but you know the native plant society does not recommend any type of chemicals you know at all for these type of removal but torpedo grass is one of those exceptions to the rule where you can't get it's very difficult to get rid of it without chemicals if you are going to use the glycosate i would i would try to paint it on the leaves themselves rather than the overspray because the feeder roots are very close to the surface and on those oak trees so i, I would brush it on yeah, I would recommend maybe contact. I mean, I'm no uh, herbicide mm -hmm. expert, so, you know, IFAS has lots of information on herbicides and, you know, your county extension agent probably would be able to discuss yeah. appropriate application for your situation with you. And they might even be able to do a site visit. Mm -hmm. um, Michael Koner gives us kudos on this presentation, but mm -hmm. would like to know if we're planning on doing a session or two on transitioning from what we have to what we should have. We will be doing a future talk. Um, my fellow Native Plant Society chapter member, Taylor Figueroa and I do a joint presentation about how we've converted our yards and we are planning on updating that and providing that as well. From, from A to Z, here's how we started, here's how we got rid of the grass, here's how 
we prepared the site for planting and here's why we picked the certain native plants and then you know photos of the after so we will be doing that in the future uh, but you know if you join your local chapter you'll you'll meet dozens of people who have already done that and get pointers you know just from talking and socializing with your local chapter members Sorry, I had to pop in the chat there. They're, they're always kind of sharing information. That's the one thing about the chapter. You get really great information. There, there's a, a guest speaker every month, um, really interesting topics, but the, the fun part of it is social aspect where everyone kind of chats and, oh, I tried this plant, I did this plant, and this is how I do it. And you, know, you really learn a lot. And when, when the uh, pandemic is over, um, most chapters have a monthly field trip as well. And that's just fascinating to go on a hike outdoors and see these native plants in the wild. Um, and then always on those field trips, people are chatting and talking about plants and, and, and all of that information. It's a good group of people. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Gotta get in with your chapter. And sort of leading into that, Graciela Martin says, as a landscape architecture student, what would be your advice in learning Florida's native plants? Ah, well, joining a chapter. <laughs> I don't know uh, if you're at UF, uh, probably UF if you're a landscape architecture student, but um, exploring the resources on the Native Plant Society website, the Gainesville chapter, the Paynes Prairie chapter, is one of our larger, more successful chapters in the state. Um, connect up with a couple of people in that chapter, um, contact them, and um, that would be my recommendation. We also have a list of books on the website. We have mm -hmm. our magazine, The Palmetto. We have some older older palmettos, um, and I, can, I have actually a number of palmettos that I could send you with articles on specific native plants and ecosystems. Um, so yeah, we have old palmetto articles from certain authors on the fnps.org website. I would look at our downloadable document section. I would join iNaturalist and start taking photos of plants you see in the wild and learning to identify them. And the, the book section of fnps.org has a list of books that uh, we recommend for learning native plants. So pick one and just start learning botanical terms and you know going out in nature around where you live and you know figuring mm -hmm. out what those plants are. And, and also, I don't know if they're still in business, but the San Falasco nursery, native plant nursery out near the Gainesville area, just go to a native plant nursery and they're all tagged with the name, the botanical name and just walk around and, you know, take note uh, of the plants at the native plant nurseries. Yeah, great suggestion. Yeah. And our YouTube channel has some botanical wanderings from the Panhandle and Central Florida uh, where, you know, Susan Carr and Lily Anderson Messick are identifying plants in the wild so that you can look at. We also have some stuff about restoration and uh, I'll be making some more of these Lunch and Learns public in the future as I, as I edit them. So um, there should be some more educational opportunities there for native plants and native plant communities. Uh, Michael Koner asks, is there a website showing gardens that are native that would show new planting and mature gardens and their transitions over the years? It, we struggle to find really good imagery for that. Um, Individuals have some of those photos, but there's, in my opinion, there's really no good public site to go to, unfortunately. So we do have our landscape awards. And oh, yeah. so we have some photos of before and after for our landscape award winners. And um, I'll get that link for you after I'm done with <laughs> going through the chat. <laughs> um, let's see. How do I find my chapter? Okay, I'll drop something in the chat there. Beth A asks, any experience with weed torches for getting rid of weeds and driveway cracks, etc." I don't know what that is. It's like a, it's like a, it has a propane, you put propane on your back and then you've got a thing and then you like light up the weeds. Hmm. Uh, I, I don't have any experience with that to answer that question. I, I would think that the seat, I, I don't know. I've used them in a horticulture setting, you know, next to next to small seedlings, vegetable seed, seedlings, but I've never used them in sidewalk cracks. They work great for small weeds. 
but once the weeds get large enough, it doesn't matter if you desiccate, like you burn the top leaf material, if there's enough root material, they just come back. It also it does not, back. yeah, and it doesn't destroy most seed coats. So, you know, if you have lots of a huge seed bank, it won't get rid of that. But if you have like smaller weeds, um, it probably would work. I've, I've seen a pressure washer with water in cracks, like sidewall be successful um, with that high pressure of the water. I've, I have seen that. Okay, okay. Um, and v Vandeflor, I just put the, our chapter look up here in the chat um, so that you can, you can see that. Um, let's see, ooh, interesting question from John McGraw. Do we have do you have any recommendations to deal with porterweed devastation from borers? From borers, um, yeah, I don't really know. I've never uh, had borers in my porterweed before. Is it native porterweed or non-native? That would be a, a good distinction to to learn up front. Um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, so Harrison is now asking, I think he's in the Bahamas, so he's in zone hardiness 10B and has clay soil. What type of grass and native plants would be suitable for his location? So, I mean, you know, because you're not in Florida, our, our plant search database, which I'll drop in the chat here, you know, it is for Florida native plants. So, but I mean, we do share native plants with the Bahamas. So yeah. if you do run a plant list for say Miami or the Keys, you know, you might find plants that, that overlap oh. and you can choose your soil type and uh, water requirements um, in in the plant finder. I, I I would get some soil samples and send it to the Miami area University of Florida Extension Service to to get an idea of the exact soils that you've got, and then kind of go from there. What grows well in those type of soils, you know, from the various plant lists available. Okay. Oh, well, Graciela says she's at FIU. I hope I'm oh. saying your name right. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, great. Um, is that down in Southeast Florida? Florida International? Yeah, FIU, yeah. Broward County? I believe it is, yeah. Broward County. We have a great chapter in Broward County, Graciela. Yeah, they're, they're fantastic. It's called the Broward Chapter. Um, Richard Brownscombe and some other fantastic people are running that chapter, so... Uh, definitely reach out to them and they can show you um, all of the great, you have really high biodiversity small parks down there. Um, let's see, Rosalie Hewin says, Bonita Springs has planted a native plant garden. It is gorgeous and was planted two years ago. It's open on Tuesdays and Saturdays. They grow plants for sale also. And that's the Kokolova chapter um, cutting horse eco center, which is our chapter of the Florida Native Plant Society who developed that amazing site. Okay. Really proud of that. Um, let's see. All right, that is all the questions in the chat. Um, so I have, I would like to say that just like PBS, this programming is brought to you by viewers like you. Did you know that we're currently running our annual fund drive and our staff and board are matching all donations up to a cumulative total of $5,000? Yes. Your native plant supporting dollars can be doubled if you contribute before the end of the year. So in addition to becoming a member, please donate to our annual fund drive and support our work to protect, conserve, and restore the native plant and native plant communities of Florida. Uh, and I'm just going to drop the donation link in the chat. So if you join this presentation, um, could you throw us a couple bucks and mm -hmm. I'll match it. and. Uh, we really appreciate if you're a member already, uh, if you care about your native plants, are working on your own lawns uh, to turn them into native plant habitat to help our songbirds and insects and other wildlife. We really appreciate you. Mm -hmm. And thank you so much, Katrina, for coming on and doing this Welcome. second series. And I look forward to the third. Okay. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. I hope everyone has a great Friday. <laughs>